first, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Good afternoon. I have with me in the studio today Dr Stephen Phillips, author of the new book Silver Lining, which is an investigation into UFOs. Now, Dr Phillips, can you tell us a little about your book? Yes, certainly. Over the last 12 years, I've become increasingly interested in the subject of UFOs, and this book is a compilation of all the sightings that I've heard about, together with evidence. You see, so many people are convinced that there is life on other planets that I thought I would do some research myself. And what did you find? Are we alone in the universe? <laughs> you sound sceptical. Well, you'll have to buy the book to find out my personal conclusion, but I can tell you this. There are a lot of sightings in a number of different countries, and the surprising fact that I have found is that despite never having met each other, a great number of these witnesses describe an almost identical object. Now, I realize that television and the media has given us all a mental picture of a UFO, a silver ship with bright lights that moves at very high speed. What interested me was that in all the eyewitness accounts I heard, people gave very precise and detailed descriptions that varied only slightly. Reports from America, Europe, even Asia, all share a significant number of similarities. Hmm, interesting. Tell me... Have you been able to see any evidence yourself? Well, no. My aim in writing this book was not really to present my own opinion, but to gather all the information available and collate it into a kind of reference guide. Personally, I don't have anything much to add apart from the conclusions that I've drawn from the accounts I've heard. I understand that there is a strong body of opinion that claims there is hard evidence that is being suppressed by the American government. Could you comment on that? Hmm. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Personally, I don't have anything much to add apart from the conclusions that I've drawn from the accounts I've heard. I understand that there is a strong body of opinion that claims there is hard evidence that is being suppressed by the American government. Could you comment on that? Hmm. The second chapter of my book actually talks about a place in America that has often been in the media, Area 51. Area 51? Yes, it's a military base in New Mexico. In 1947, a man called McBrazel claimed... Sorry, who? McBrazel. That's M-A-C, capital B-R-A-Z-E-L. Anyway, McBrazel claimed to have found pieces of an alien spacecraft on his farm in Roswell. Now, many people believe that this was true and that the government of the time took the debris. Since that time... They have denied all knowledge of any such find, and accounts by the many leading experts at the time dismissed the claim, believing that McBrazel had actually found pieces of a high-altitude weather balloon that had disintegrated. Now, the lack of information combined with a large number of conspiracy theorists means that no useful scientific conclusion can be drawn, but I have found out one or two surprising details. Again, you'll have to buy the book if you want to find out more. Okay. Now, I understand that an overwhelming majority of UFO sightings occurred in America. Do you find that in any way relevant? Well, as I mentioned before, there are a large number of conspiracy theorists, and the popularity of science fiction programs in America could lead you to suspect that these sightings may be nothing more than an overactive imagination. However, I have found that there are a number of other factors that determine UFO sightings. In Northern Europe, the number of reports is very low, whereas in Southern Europe, where there is more open space, less light pollution, and generally clearer skies, the number of sightings increases. Now, when you consider the vast open areas of America, particularly around New Mexico, there is an argument that UFOs are simply easier to see in certain geographical and climatic situations. Hmm. Well, I've never thought of that. 
If I could ask you one final question, Dr. Phillips, what about alien abduction? Uh, well, I don't really cover that in my book. You see, I was looking to present facts from which people could draw their own conclusions. With these reported abductions, I've found them to be very unreliable. Well, thank you very much for your time. Before we finish, I'd just like to add that Silver Lining is available at all leading bookstores, priced at £19.99. Until next week, goodbye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear the overseas student officer talking to some new students about the arrangements for an excursion to Ironbridge. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hello everyone. My name is Pamela Sutcliffe and most of you already know that I'm the Overseas Student Officer here at Salopian Technical College. Next Tuesday, the 28th of September, we have arranged an excursion for all new students to the important historical town of Ironbridge. We are hoping you'll all come because not only is the history of Ironbridge very important and interesting, but also an excursion like this is a relaxed and fun way to get to know each other. Ironbridge is about 55 kilometres from here and we'll be travelling by the college bus, which holds 40 people. If there are more than that, we'll bring a couple of staff cars as well, though I might ask you to indicate on the list if you have a car and would be willing to take a couple of passengers. The list I'm referring to is up there on the student notice board, and if you would like to come on Tuesday, would you please add your name as soon as possible. By the way, could you please print your name clearly? I know some people have wonderful signatures, but often I'm afraid I can't read them, which can cause problems. So if we need extra transport and you could bring your car, can you tick the car column next to your name? Could you also add your student number and your telephone number? just in case there are any last-minute changes and we have to contact you. The other information I need to give you is about lunch. There's a very nice little restaurant in Ironbridge which gives a 15% discount to the college when we bring groups. That means lunch is only about £4 and they do good vegetarian meals too, so it's usually no problem for those of you on special diets. But if you prefer to eat your own food, that's fine too, either on the bus or in the park. But I'd encourage you to try the restaurant. Now talking of costs, I should tell you that the bus will only cost you £10. And if you bring your car, we'll pay for the petrol, so you get a free trip in return for driving there. Will you please sign up by Saturday at 6pm at the latest? The list is closed after that. We will depart at 9.30am sharp on Tuesday morning, so please make sure that you arrive at least 15 minutes before so that you can find a seat and get settled on the bus. 
Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. The college bus garage is behind the engineering workshop. It's quite easy to find. If you come here to the student union building, then walk east down the avenue until you get to the childcare centre on your left, and then turn left and walk past the sports centre and the tennis courts, which are both on your left. Cross over Central Square and opposite you is the engineering workshop. Walk around the back and you'll see the bus. Please wear comfortable shoes as we'll be walking around Ironbridge and be on our feet for most of the day. Wear a warm jacket and you might like to bring an umbrella and a backpack to put them in if the weather's warm and sunny which we hope it will be, but of course we can't guarantee that. Certainly bring your cameras and any snacks or drinks for the bus journey there and back, which should take about an hour and a half each way. You should all check the notice board on Monday and we'll also put a note in your mailbox to confirm arrangements, so don't forget to check it. Now, why are we visiting Ironbridge? Well, Iron Bridge, as the name suggests, has got the original Iron Bridge. That is, the first ever Iron Bridge in the world. It was the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution, and for 40 years it led the world, as Britain changed from an agricultural society into an industrial one. It's hard to imagine today that this pretty, sleepy little tourist town was one of the most important places in England for over a century. Just imagine, 200 years ago, people from all over Europe and even North America came to Ironbridge to learn about what was then the latest technology. Today it is listed as a World Heritage Site by the United Nations as they consider the unique collection of industrial monuments rank it alongside the Grand Canyon, the Pyramids and the Great Barrier Reef. One place that's fun to visit is Blist Hill, which is a reconstruction of a small Victorian industrial town where people are working and living as they did a hundred years ago. I hope you'll enjoy the day. It's been a very popular excursion in previous years, so I'm looking forward to going again next Tuesday. Now don't forget to put your name on the list as soon as possible. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You are going to listen to a radio program about buying a house. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Good afternoon listeners. Today I'd like to welcome Edward Fox who is going to talk to us today about buying a house. Edward. Thank you Eunice. For most people at least buying a house is a major life event and probably the single most expensive item you are ever likely to buy. It is also a place that you can make your home. Therefore, thinking carefully before you make a purchase is of the utmost importance. One of the most important things to consider before buying any property is the location. Because remember, it is where you plan to spend a large part of your life, or indeed the rest of your life in some circumstances. Therefore, consider the type of life you enjoy leading. Are you a very sociable person? who enjoys nightclubs and discos? If so, then you may wish to consider something close to the city, or indeed in a city where it is convenient for all types of nightlife. On the other hand, if, like me, you prefer a quieter life, then you may want to consider something away from the city. However, do remember that proximity to your place of work is also important. Indeed, we spend most of our life at work, and you don't want to have to spend two or more hours every day travelling to work now, do you? Therefore, transport is the utmost importance. City suburbs, however, are often conveniently located for commuting to work. All for shopping. Without being in the heart of a busy city. You may, however, think that a house in the suburbs would be far too expensive. Yet houses located in cities can often exceed the price of suburban houses. So check out the prices you may be surprised. Family is another important consideration. You may prefer a house that is away from a busy street or main road. And of course, remember that children have to attend school. Is there a good school in the area? Or would your children have to travel a long distance to get to school? Therefore, if you have children, or you plan to have children, location is a very important factor. And of course, remember that a family influences the size of the property. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. And of course, remember that a family influences the size of the property. There are, of course, various types of houses. There are detached houses which stand alone and are not joined by to another building. Then there are semi-detached houses which, incidentally, are the most common and for good reason because they are less expensive than detached houses, this is because they are, in fact, two houses joined together and therefore take up less space. And finally, there are townhouses, which are many houses joined together to form a long row. But don't think that townhouses are less expensive than semi-detached houses. They rarely are. This is because they are usually built in cities where the prices of property is very expensive indeed. The age of property is another consideration. If you're considering buying an old house, beware. You may be faced with expensive repairs and renovation bills. So have the house thoroughly checked by a professional surveyor before you decide to buy. But then again, there are things you can look for yourself. Things such as the condition of the woodwork, especially doors and windows that can be expensive to replace. More importantly, make sure all the fixtures and fittings Things such as cupboards, sinks, taps, bathtubs are all in good working order because replacing kitchens and bathrooms can be a very costly business. And don't forget the garden. If the property has one, if you enjoy gardening, then fine. But if you don't enjoy gardening, then you may prefer a small garden as opposed to a big one. But even if you do enjoy gardening, it is important to remember that gardens take up a lot of your time. So keeping a garden in good order 
may be a very difficult if you work long hours. One final thing is the general feel of the place. Does it have a good atmosphere? And most importantly of all, would you feel comfortable living there? Thank you, Edward. But I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. But I'll be back next Wednesday when my guest speaker will be talking about buying a computer. So until then, bye for now. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You'll hear a lecture on human civilization. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Today in our History Series lectures, Professor Smith is going to introduce the history of human civilization. Welcome, Professor Smith. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Do you know when human civilization originated? And what's the development of human language? Well, the first two stages in the development of civilized man were probably the invention of primitive weapons and the discovery of fire, though nobody knows exactly when he acquired the use of the latter. The origin of language is also obscure. No doubt it began very gradually. Animals have a few cries that serve as signals, but even the highest apes have not been found able to pronounce words, even with the most intensive professional instruction. Apparently, a necessity for the mastering of speech is the superior brain of man. When man became sufficiently intelligent, we must suppose that he gradually increased the number of cries for different purposes. It was a great day when he discovered that speech could be used for narrative. There are those who think that in this respect, picture language preceded oral language. A man could draw a picture on the wall of his cave to show in which direction he had gone, or what prey he hoped to catch. Probably picture language and oral language developed side by side. I'm inclined to think that language has been the most important single factor in the development of man. Two important stages came not so long before the dawn of written history. The first was the domestication of animals. The second was agriculture. Agriculture was a step in human progress to which, subsequently, there was nothing comparable until our own machine age. Agriculture made possible an immense increase in the number of the human species in the regions where it could be successfully practiced. These were, at first, only those in which nature fertilized the soil after each harvest. Agriculture met with violent resistance from the pastoral nomads, but the agricultural way of life prevailed in the end because of the physical comforts it provided. Another fundamental technical advance was writing, which, like spoken language, developed out of pictures, but as soon as it had reached a certain stage, it was possible to keep records and transmit information to people who were not present when the information was given. These inventions and discoveries, fire, speech, weapons, domestic animals, agriculture, and writing, made the existence of civilized communities possible. From about 3000 BC until the Industrial Revolution, less than 200 years ago, there was no technical advance comparable to these. 
During this long period, man had enough time to become accustomed to his technique and to develop the beliefs and political organizations to appropriate it. There was, of course, an immense extension in the area of civilized life. At first, it had been confined to the Nile, the Euphrates, the Tigris, and the Indus. But at the end of the period in question, it covered much the greater part of the livable globe. I do not mean to suggest that there was no technical progress during this long time. There was progress. There were even two inventions of great importance, namely gunpowder and the mariner's compass. But neither of these can be compared in their revolutionary power to such things as speech and writing and agriculture. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.